Since the early 2000s, when Israel Finkelstein's low chronology of Iron Age Palestine became a serious threat to the idea that Solomon was a great builder king, several archaeologists, usually of medium to low repute, have suggested linking places they are excavating with the biblical united monarchy, said in the Bible to have been ruled by the early to mid 10th century BC Jerusalemite kings David and Solomon. The second archaeologist, as I shall call them, we must deal with, is T. E. Levy, the excavator of Kitabet and Nahas, a ruin of a 24-acre Iron Age 1 and 2A copper mine and Assyrian fortress located five miles to the northwest of Penan, biblical Punan. Levy has claimed that this mine may be associated with Solomonic copper production or the emergence of the kingdom of Edom, a southern Transjordanian kingdom known to non-biblical history from the early 8th to the mid-6th centuries BC. He has also claimed that the fortress is contemporary with the mine. Both of these claims, as we shall see below, are false. I shall first deal with the claim that this mine has anything to do with the biblical Solomonic Empire or the kingdom of Edom. In order to do this, we must not start Nahas, but in the wilderness of Tzin. In the late 10th and early 9th centuries, the date being confirmed by radiocarbon dates from the Tzinite enclosure of Atar Haroa, hundreds of settlements were built in the biblical wilderness of Tzin. These settlements were often enclosed with casemate walls, and their inhabitants used a type of extremely crude and chronologically widespread pottery called Negevite ware. The inhabitants of these settlements also used typical early Iron Age 2A red-slipped hand-burnished pottery, but no late Iron 2A pottery forms associated with the monumental architecture formerly associated with Solomon, but now logically associated with the Omrides. What caused this massive wave of people to settle in an area so hostile to productive settlement as the wilderness of Tsin? There is no evidence of any refugee crises in the Negev in the transition between Iron Ages 1 and 2a, and the Arabian spice trade was not a cause of massive settlement in the wilderness of Tsin in the later Iron Age. The answer is thus, most obviously. The benefits the wilderness of Tzin received from the booming Iron Age 1 to 2A Arava copper trade. Kirbet and Nahas was the largest Iron Age copper mine in the Arava. But what political entity controlled the Kirbet and Nahas copper mine? The answer must lie in Kirbet and Nahas's radiocarbon dates and its pottery. Typical Iron Age 1 pithoi, including some collar rimmed ones, have been found at Kirbet and Nahas in notable quantities. This indicates Kirbet and Nahas was founded in Iron Age 1. The radiocarbon dates are also consistent with this assertion, placing the founding of Iron Age Kirbet and Nahas at around 1000 BC, when the Iron Age 1 was still taking place. But what polity could have ruled this Iron Age 1 copper mine? Levi and Najjar once suggested it was the biblical kingdom of Edom. While there was some Iron 1 settlement on the Edomite plateau, no Iron Age Edomite site yet surveyed or excavated gave any indication it was in any way connected with copper working. Indeed, the great settlement wave in the early Iron 2A Levant took place in the wilderness of Tzin, along the routes to Egypt and the Gaza Strip, while not a single sherd of Iron 2A pottery has been discovered on the Edomite Plateau. Thus, we are left with a Western origin for the political entity that ruled Kirbet and Nahas. The closest Iron Age 1 settlement to the west of Nahas with the capability to rule a political entity of any significance is Telmasos, a 15-acre site at the western outlet of the Mamsis Road between the Arava and the Beersheba Valley. The site was first inhabited after a nearly 2,000-year occupation gap in the Iron Age 1, rose to its settlement height in the early Iron 2A, and was abandoned soon after the transition between early and late Iron Ages 2A 
to be resettled as a small Judahite fortress in Area C. Strong evidence of copper working was found at Telmasos. A copper crucible was found in a building in Area C, and a copper workshop with remains of copper ore was found in a building in Area A. Thus, it makes good sense to postulate that it was the political entity centered at Telmasos, which controlled the Kirbet and the Haas copper mine. The Telmasos polity was separate from, but related to, the phenomenon of the massive early iron to a settlement of the wilderness of Tsin. The Beersheba Valley sites of the Telmasos polity did not use the so-called Negevite pottery, only one Negevite vessel being discovered at Telmasos, and none at Tel Esdar, a five-acre site on the road from Telmasos to Kirvet and Nahas. However, both the Beersheba Valley and the Wilderness of Zin experienced a settlement boost in the early Iron 2A. For example, a rod in the eastern Beersheba Basin was refounded for the first time in over a thousand years during the Iron 2A. This situation is even reflected on the walls of the Temple of Karnak in Egyptian Thebes. On the topographic list of Shawshank I, a Libyan king of all Egypt between the 940s and 920s BC, who campaigned in Palestine and erected a stele at Megiddo, there are found several toponyms, which are clearly associated with the Beersheba Basin. Among them are two Arads, three Negevs, and five Hagers, probably a predecessor of Joshua 15's Hatzars. Clearly, one of Shawshank I's campaigns was aimed at subduing, and possibly expanding, the Telmasos polity, as there is no evidence of destruction in any place in the wilderness of Tsin or Beersheba Valley at the time of Shawshank I. Indeed, Egyptian influence is even reflected inside Telmasos itself. A mud brick building, similar in plan to Egyptian Amarna style houses, was found near the southern entrance of the town of Telmasos. The building also contained some clearly non Egyptian features, such as the use of stone in its foundation and the division of its main hall into two parts by the use of a single row of six pillars. It might either have been an imitation of an Egyptian plan by the locals or evidence of Egyptian residence at Telmasos. But which stronger local polity dominated the Telmasos polity? It is extraordinarily unlikely the Telmasos polity was politically independent. Telmasos was unfortified and thus very much subject to attack by organized armies, especially from the west. The only way it could have prevented such attacks was to ally with a power that could command such organized armies. But which power did it ally with? Judah to the north, or Gaza or Gat to the west? The answer may have been found in the pottery of the Iron to Eight Sinite sites, which were economically dependent on the activities of the Telmasos chiefdom. According to a comment left by Aaron Mayer on his blog, summarizing a lecture by Mario Martin, even the Negevite ware was not produced in the wilderness of Tsin, but was rather produced in two regions, the region of Kirbet and Nahas, and the region of southeast Philistia. Thus, it was most likely that the Telmasos chiefdom was allied with the Philistine kingdom of Gaza, not with the kingdom of Judah. Thus, it is clear that Levi's assertion that the Kirbet and the Haas mine was under the control of the united monarchy of Israel and Judah, or the kingdom of Edom, is false. The political entity that controlled the earlier phase of the Kirbet and the Haas mine was a Beersheba Valley-centered chiefdom with roots in the Iron Age I, most probably allied with the lesser power of the kingdom of Gaza and the greater power of post-New Kingdom Egypt. However, the story of Girbit and Nahas does not end with the Telmasos chiefdom. According to the radiocarbon dates in the site, production at Girbet and Nahas continued down to the end of the 9th century BC. The Telmasos chiefdom collapsed in the late Iron 2A due to a resurgence of copper production in Cyprus and good Amorite relations with the Phoenicians, 
who had the dominant economic position over Cyprus. After the end of the Telmasos chieftain, Judah took over most of the Beersheba Valley, and thus very likely took over Kirbet and Nahas. This situation is likely reflected in the Bible, as Jehoshaphat is said there to have ruled over Edom, and have set up a deputy as king. According to the Bible, Judah lost its control over Edom in the year 848 BC, or soon after. According to the Nimrud slab of Adad-Nirari III, king of Assyria, the kingdom of Edom paid tribute to Assyria, presumably in 796 BC. Thus, copper production at Kirbet and Nahas continued under the young kingdom of Edom for about a half century.